Hey everyone, it's Susan Pierce Thompson and welcome to the weekly vlog. So uh, last week I recorded 15 years of Bright Lines uh, part one and I turned on the camera with no idea what I was going to say. This year's, uh, this week, <laughs> this week is like the opposite. I have a bulleted list in my head of things I want to talk about because I've been thinking all week. I knew I would record a part two. I promised that last week and I've gotten really clear on the rest of what I want to say after 15 years of putting my food on the scale, no sugar, no flour, you know, um, in particular, I just want to be clear, you know this if you've been watching my vlog for any period of time, I have not kept perfect bright lines for 15 years. I started doing this 15 years ago and um, I think that's 5,480 days or something and I just want to quantify it for you. I believe that I've kept immaculate bright lines for about 5,200 of those days, roughly. And I've had roughly 300 days over um, 15 years that have not been bright line days. Now, as anyone who's a, a 10 on the susceptibility scale knows, if you're breaking your bright lines every now and then, like every couple weeks or every month or every once a week or whatever, um, it feels like everything's off, right? You know what I mean? It feels like, oh, I'm, I'm really slipping around. I'm not doing well. Um, so there have been months even years where I've felt like I wasn't doing well, really the last three years actually have been kind of like that. The stress of trying to be the CEO of this Bright Line Eating movement has been enormous. And I've got three little kids and um, I feel really called to do what I'm doing, um, but the load of it has been high. And um, factor in that I've been kind of experimenting with where I get my own support from, you know, like sort of leaving the 12 step food world behind and experimenting with getting my support from Brightline Eating. But oh, by the way, I can't lean in like another bozo on the bus because I lead this thing and some people really need me to be sort of the expert who has it all together. And, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to get support from the same place that I'm sort of whatever. <laughs> I eschew all terms, whatever, the grand poobah of the bright line eating uh, float in the parade, whatever. Um, so anyway, I have all this to say, I have all this rich experience of like the bright line eating journey when you're keeping your bright lines perfectly for weeks and months and years. I haven't hit decades yet, but I, I've, I think I hit like eight and a half years once of not having a single baby carrot off my plan. That's a long time, right? Versus what the bright line eating journey is like when you're not keeping your bright lines. And I have, I think, richer and more nuanced thoughts about that than I've ever had. So that's what I want to share with you this week. So in particular, I want to share uh, my thoughts about like, how rigorous do you need to be in keeping your bright lines anyway, right? And what's the best way to track what you're doing? And what are the qualitative differences between the times when you're keeping your bright lines and the times when you're not keeping your bright lines, right? And then um, lastly, sort of like why? Like what, what, what's, what are the big motivators driving all this? Okay, so that's, that's what I wanna kinda cover. So the first question is how rigorous do you need to be? Um, and the answer to that is really clear. It depends on how high you are on the susceptibility scale. It also depends on your goals. So for example, um, there's a big difference between being comfortable landing somewhere at a normal BMI, which, you know, it, in my frame, I'm 5'3". A normal BMI for me is 15 pounds lighter than I am right now today, and also 22 pounds heavier than I am right now, today. actually 25 pounds heavier than I am right now today. That's a big range, baby, right? So if you're happy being anywhere in that ballpark, in other words, if you're happy being 10, 20 pounds above the, 30 pounds above the French formula, which is if you're female, 100 pounds um, for every five feet tall, and then five additional pounds for each inch above that. So if you're 5'3", 115 pounds. If you're 5'5", 5, 5, 125 pounds. It's a rather slender female. Um, if you're comfortable being 10, 20, 30 pounds heavier than that, then you don't have to be as rigorous with your bright lines because your brain's not gonna fight you as hard. The last 10 pounds really are the hardest to get off. And you have to be way more precise with your bright lines to get those last you know, few pounds off. But also, 
if you're high on the susceptibility scale, you just have fewer degrees of freedom. Like you just, you know, little deviations start to rock the boat really hard. Um, and the consequences are just really high, right? Like if I eat off my plan a little bit, I'm likely to have a full on binge. Um, that binge is likely to be so physically debilitating that it's hard to function for a couple days. The amount of sugar that I'm likely to ingest during a binge is likely to be so great that I'm likely to suffer for some like low grade depression for several days. Um, and then I'm likely to have a really hard time getting back on track. So it could be days or weeks or months or God forbid even years before I'm actually really back on track, right? So the consequences if you're high on the susceptibility scale to deviating are really high. If you're a three on the susceptibility scale, there's hardly any consequences at all because you have a system that naturally doesn't like to binge. You get full and you push the plate away. That doesn't happen for me. I don't get full and push the plate away. My system gets full, but my brain always wants more food. So my mouth and my brain will keep eating food even when I was long since completely full. Um, there are times when I don't feel fullness at all, completely no sense of fullness. I could just eat a house and I never feel full. Um, but if you're a three on the susceptibility scale, you're not going to binge and you're naturally going to get full and, um, you're just not going to ingest the kinds of quantities of food that are going to make you the food equivalent of drunk. So the hangover is not going to be as bad and you're naturally, your system is naturally going to get back to a naturally sort of an equilibrium way faster. So the consequences just aren't as bad. So if you combine low susceptibility with some sort of flexibility in terms of your ultimate goal weight, like you're just not looking to get super, super, you know, thin, super lean, then the answer is you don't, you're not going to need to be as rigid with keeping your bright lines, right? So the key is do what works for you and do what makes you free, right? The bright line framework is there as as a framework. There's sort of like lines on the freeway, right? Is it, a, is it a horrible thing to like drive over the lines on the freeway? Well, it could be if you're going into oncoming traffic, that's when you're at 10 on the susceptibility scale. You know, it could also be if there's a car next to you and you don't wanna, you know, get into their lane, or it could be not a big deal at all. If you're going around a curve on a mountain road, there's no one coming the other way, and you're just like hugging the, the line a little bit and you go a little bit over it, it could not mean anything, right? You just write, write the car, get back into your lane, no harm, no foul, right? So how rigorous you need to be in keeping your bright lines totally depends on your susceptibility scale score and your, and your goals for your bright line eating journey. So is it worth it to count days? Um, in the boot camp, in the bright line eating boot camp, I encourage people to count days and I always used to count days and you know, I wouldn't have known that I had eight and a half years of squeaky clean bright lines if I hadn't been counting my days. There are certain dates like I've been clean and sober since August 9th, 1994. Um, I counted every one of those days. I still count those days. I still carry a, a, a token, a coin that marks my length of sobriety. It means a lot to me. Um, and I have to say now that I'm, you know, 43 and I haven't had a drink since I was 20. Um, there are times when my sobriety, like the number of days that I've amassed is really the only thing that keeps me from having a glass of red wine. I'll just be frank. It's the only thing I just, you know, it takes a long time to get 23 years of sobriety. I don't have to do that one over, right? It's the only reason I don't have a glass of red wine. Otherwise I would, right? There's people around me who are drinking. I have a narrative in my head that says, you know, I was really scarcely more than a potential alcoholic. I'm not a drug addict, don't get me wrong. Oh, I'm clear. Crystal meth, crack cocaine, yeah, no. Wine, beer, I don't know, right? I'm way older now. There is a narrative in my head that says maybe that would work. I don't do it because I got 23 years of sobriety. I'm not doing that one over again. So if you get to a point with your bright line eating journey where you've been keeping your bright lines and you've been counting days, you can get to a point where the day count really serves you because you don't want to start over from zero. And that in and of itself can be enough to keep you from picking up the food in a challenging situation. If you've started over a bunch of times, like I have, and you've had a million day ones, does it serve you to count days again? <laughs> and the answer is maybe yes, maybe no, right? There are times even after a million restarts where um, the, how do I put this? 
the spiritual experience of the epiphany of of how you're going to do things differently the new resolve the like feeling of turning over a new leaf feels so significant that counting days afresh can be really empowering and then there can be other times where the most empowering thing is to do this one day at a time and to take that philosophy of the person who got up the earliest is the person who's got the longest amount of time with bright lines, right? Because we're all doing this one day at a time. So I got up at 5 a.m. What time did you get up? I've been doing this for, you know, umpty hours, right? Like that's the way to think about it. It's one day at a time. And if you think of yourself as doing this for the rest of your life, there really is no benefit to knowing how many days. It doesn't matter how many days, right? We're doing this one day at a time. We're accountable in the day to ourselves. We're on the journey no matter what the day count is irrelevant, right? So I've seen it work both ways for me. And um, I invite you to count your days or not, depending on what serves you. It, it, it's all come, it all comes back to do what serves you. Do what gives you peace, right? And what about that question of like, what's the qualitative difference between being on your bright lines and being off your bright lines? Because um, I used to believe that when I picked up my drug as an addict, and food is by far my drug of choice, I used to believe that when I picked up a drug, I cut myself off from God. I used to believe that God was always there, but as an addict, when I pick up my drug, I'm shielding myself from the sunlight of the Spirit. And I have to say that in my experience, that's not true. I have found that over the last three years, over the last 20 some odd years of food recovery, I've been in food recovery since I was 21 years old, 22 years. Thinking of myself as a food addict, doing my best to be in food recovery for 22 years. And I found that um, God has felt closer to me. I have been more connected with my notion of a higher power. My entirely inadequate comprehension of that unknowable essence that just feels so warm and miraculous and comforting and and um, present if I can manage to tune into it. That, that sense of presence has been more full and more profound in the depths of my active food addiction, in that hung over, I cannot believe I'm here again moment than at any other time. Honestly, I feel God more then. Not always, but often enough that I claim it. Like, I don't anymore believe that when I pick up my drug, I cut myself off from God. God's there still. And I don't believe anymore that when I pick up my drug, I stop my growth. I've heard that one too, especially in 12-step rooms, that, that, that when you start using, you stop growing. So in other words, the idea would be that someone, like I started drinking and using when I was 14. So the idea is then I basically didn't grow as a human being from the time I was 14 till the time I was 20 when I got clean. Yeah, I don't believe that either. Uh, it's just not true in my experience. I'm growing all the time. Um, yeah, I'm growing all the time. What I have experienced is when I'm breaking my bright lines habitually, the growth is of a different kind. It's a very self-absorbed inward type of growth. I can't, um, I just can't be available to others in the same way. If I'm going on and off my bright lines, my growth is all about why am I doing this? What's driving me? What changes do I need to make? Am I willing, am I not willing? Can I get support today or not? Am I ready to resume or not? Do I have inner issues to sort out or is this just my brain misfiring? Do I need to adjust my food plan? Like, that's what I'm thinking about when I'm off my bright lines. So it's a very self-absorbed, inwardly focused type of growth. But in my experience, massive profound shifts and profound growth can come out of that. Like that's the time when I might notice 
you know, there's an inner childhood issue here that I've never addressed. That if I don't really do some work on, I'm just not going to be able to stick to my bright lines. Or I'm not really willing to slow down my life. And unless I become willing to slow down my life and, and prioritize my self-care more, I'm not going to be able to stick with my bright lines. Why do I have a hero complex? Or, um, you know, million types of things like that. But it's really an inwardly focused type of growth. If I'm sticking with my bright lines, then food fades into the background. I'm not thinking about food. I don't need to think about food. Food's handled. So now I'm available to my family. I'm available to life, like to exercise, to start hobbies, to um, make career advancements or career shifts, to work on my relationship um, with my spouse or my, uh, my friendships, my primary relationships. I'm also available more to support others and their struggles. You know, I'm fresh from like, oh yeah, my addiction exists. It's in my rear view mirror. How can I help you with yours? I'm available to be of service. So I'm growing, it's just in a different way. It's in, it's in an outwardly focused way. It's just a different type of growth. It's all growth, We're always growing. So lastly, I just wanna address the question of why. Why can't we sometimes stick to our bright lines? Um, and why stick to our bright lines in the first place? Well, why can't we sometimes stick? I think there's two reasons why we can't stick to our bright lines sometimes. One is inner work that needs to be done like inner inner stuff that hasn't been sorted out, right? And then the second reason is the more mechanical, trivial brain reason of like eating begets more eating and I eat because I'm a food addict, right? Nothing fancy about that, <laughs> right? Um, and for me, high on the susceptibility scale, once I've been breaking my bright lines, I'm going to kind of keep breaking my bright lines unless I make major shifts. In both cases, whether it's inner work, like the need to heal on a deep level and sort out my inner landscape, or if it's like I'm a food addict and eating begets more eating and it's a habit now that I'm breaking my bright lines just habitually and it's just like a brain malfunction, right? Either one of those things, it doesn't matter. The answer is always get more support. Same answer, get more support. But if it's the inner issue, that support needs to be of a specific kind. And I, I've come to believe now that it needs to be parts work. It needs to be figuring out the landscape of the parts that are operating inside of us and what their agendas and needs and wounds are. Because we're not just one person in there. We're like differentiated sort of characters with their own wounds and needs and agendas. And if we're eating, it might be that there's a rebellious teenager who's like needing to indulge for some reason. Or it might be that there's a really wounded little girl in there who's needing the food for comfort. Or, you know, it might be that there's a controller who is, um, you know, so intent on not messing this up again that another part feels strangled and needs to rebel, right? So there's parts in there. Anyone who's been on this journey of trying to lose weight over any period of time has experienced the inner war, right? Will I, won't I? Am I about to eat this? Am I not? Those are different parts. They have different agendas. And if you haven't sorted out that landscape, they, those parts will keep, you know, derailing the train. If the issue is more around habits and eating begets more eating, the answer is more support and it's in the realm of like accountability, commitment, um, lowering the stress bar, raising the support bar. It's more those sorts of lifestyle interventions. Like you put yourself in a better environment with more support, more accountability, someone that you give authority to, and all of a sudden the problem can be solved. No parts work needed, right? Like just solve it through structural adjustments. And why do this anyway? I mean, ultimately I do it because I have to. <laughs> now I do it because I love to. But initially I just did it because I have to, because I, I have to because I am not comfortable being overweight or obese. I'm just not. And I'm a very ambitious person driven by personal growth. Like Maslow's top of his pyramid, that drive for self-actualization, I got that. I don't know why I just do. Like I'm not staying, standing still. I'm gonna be a better person tomorrow than I am today. Like that's just my way. I don't know about tomorrow, but next year. <laughs> Give me enough time, I'll be a better person than I am today. I'm driven like that. 
And throughout my entire childhood, adolescence, and early adulthood, whenever I would think about how I could improve myself, number one on the list was I gotta lose weight. It was just true for me that I was not comfortable showing up to the world in the body I was in. And, and it, it wasn't just vanity, although I got that, but it wasn't just vanity. It was also the reality that my relationship with food was an issue. I wasn't eating in a way that was in alignment with my values and the way I wanted to treat myself. And it was bizarre to me that I kept lying to myself and betraying myself with food. And I knew I had to sort that out and figure out how to get healthy and right-sized before I could really go to the next level. For me, food has always been primary. I don't know why. When I make the list of ways I need to improve, it's always been at the top of the list. I can't tell you why. All I know is that it's true for me. So I do this because I have to, because I'm not standing still, I'm gonna improve, and it's the top of the list for me. It always has been. You know, you can decide for yourself why you do this. Maybe you're not doing this. Maybe you're just watching every week just as a looky-loo thinking, do I wanna do this? I don't know, right? I wanna close by circling back to the first thing I was talking about around like how, how, how rigorous do we need to keep our bright lines? In my experience, sorry, I'm gonna say this, I'm, I'm gonna offend somebody. Most people, not everybody, most people lie to themselves about their experience with bright line eating. And what I mean by that is most people who've experienced bright line eating a little bit think that they've done it to a degree and they actually haven't. <laughs> like they think that because they mostly don't eat sugar, mostly don't eat flour and kind of watch my vlogs sometimes that they kind of know what bright line eating is about. The reality is that someone with that profile has no clue. Like if you haven't actually gotten the food plan out, gotten a digital food scale, written down your food the night before and then spent a series of days eating only and exactly that, while simultaneously working to set up a morning routine and an evening routine consistent with what I talk about in the 14 day challenge and in the book and in the boot camp, you haven't actually done bright line eating. You actually have no idea what we're doing here. Little idea maybe, but no, sort of the same as like, I watched a documentary once about Afghanistan and the war in Afghanistan versus I was a soldier in Afghanistan for three tours of duty, right? Very different story, right? Um, most people lie to themselves about bright line eating. They think they kind of get what it's about, but actually they really have not done it. Um, then there are people who go, who are on the other extreme. They're doing bright line eating completely and they feel like a fraud and they shouldn't because they're doing great. We've got some of those in bright lifers too. Uh, if that's you, I just threw you a wink. Anyway, um, I'm so grateful. 15 years in, Give me another 15 any day, like I'm in. This is just, I'm here for the long term. I love that you tune every week, tune in every week or some weeks or occasionally or whatever it is that you do. Thank you for spending time with me. I love you and I'll see you next week.